Is now a good time? Okay, perfect. All right, I'd like to thank Jelani for the uh, invitation to speak and also all the conference organizers for all the arrangements they've made. Uh, today I'll be talking about chaining random matrices in dictionary learning. And uh, it's worth mentioning that there's uh, an uncomfortable overlap with Odin's presentation from yesterday. I considered remodeling the presentation, uh, but Family Guy was on last night. Uh, and also, I'm convinced that it's worth seeing a lot of this material twice. So hopefully, you, you'll agree. Oh, come on. Let me give a brief overview of the presentation. So I'll, I'll give an incomplete survey of dictionary, dictionary learning, the problem, some of the applications, and uh, some previous results. Then we'll segue into some of my results with Van Vu. And in particular, we'll focus on some of the proof techniques that involve chaining. And at the end, we'll mention some more recent results that improve our bounds uh, by some different authors. One second. Ah, here it is. That's why. OK. So the general recovery problem, uh, uh, one that dictionary learning falls under, is uh, imagine we're given, presented a n by p matrix Y. And we know that it's the product of an invertible matrix A and an M by P matrix X. The question is then, given Y, can it recover A and X? And in general, you'll see there's N times P equations, but there are N squared plus N times P unknowns. And so the problem is underdetermined in general. But in applications, generally, you can make some assumptions on x. And the most common one is that x is, in fact, a sparse matrix, meaning there are very few non-zero entries. So the number of unknowns decreases dramatically, and the problem is a little more tractable. Let me introduce some of the terminology in the field. So A is generally referred to as the dictionary. And in particular, the columns of A are the dictionary elements. And x is known as the observation matrix. And the reason is each column of Y is a linear combination of the columns of A. And the corresponding column in X indicates the linear combination. So you can think of a column of X as an observation of a linear combination of signals. And since X is sparse, each column of Y is a linear combination of very few dictionary elements. So now's the time to sort of motivate the problem. We'll talk about some of the applications. It's dic learning dictionaries are often used in compression, denoising, classification, recommendation systems, and blind source separation. I'm not going to have time to have a deep discussion of these. It'll take us too far afield, and it risks showing how little I know about these problems. So let me discuss just a few visually compelling examples. Image processing was actually one of the first places where dictionary learning appeared. And I've stolen this image from a presentation by Tardivelle and co-authors. And don't ask me what those three things are. But in general, think of the image as a matrix, where each pixel value is uh, entry in the matrix. And then the common technique is to look at patches, overlapping patches of the image. And you can think of each patch as a column vector, if you want, in our original problem. And so each of these patches is a, a signal, or column of the matrix Y. And with uh, an appropriate dictionary learning algorithm, you can reconstruct a dictionary that approximates, approximates each of these patches 
with very few linear combinations of the elements. And so we're going to have to take a few things on faith. First of all, that uh, such an algorithm exists, and we'll, we'll present one later. But once you have a nice dictionary, then there are many powerful applications. And here's a, a potential dictionary that could be created from that image. And there's a whole art in choosing the size of the patches. And, that's, and anybody familiar with machine learning will know that choosing the test data is an art in itself and a whole separate discussion. And many times, the image itself, whether we're learning from the original image or a patchwork of the original image, or in fact, just a similar image, there are whole uh, fields dedicated to each of these. And so one potential application is image denoising. So assuming you have a nice dictionary for the original image, I add some random noise to it. And the basic algorithm or intuition is pretty simple. I'm going to go over each patch, and then I approximate it with the dictionary that I know, and then take the average and the outputs on the right. Fairly impressive. Uh, a more interesting one is facial recognition. And in this case, the test data is obvious. We're going to take a bunch of shots of people's faces and then try to learn a dictionary from those. And this is some test data and some of the dictionary elements generated from it. And some of you might think you're too good looking to be sparsely represented by these guys. And I'm not saying you're wrong, but most faces can be represented by six or seven of these. A linear combination of six or seven, which is quite surprising. And here's a few of those examples. And one of the implications is facial compression. So if I were to take your mugshot and represent it instead as a, a matrix and record every pixel, depending on the resolution, that can be intensive memory-wise. And so there are many compression techniques. So the, the two faces on the left, those are the original high-resolution high images. And everything to the right of those have been compressed to the same amount of memory. And so you can see JPEG's compression algorithm. Looks like these guys just walked out of a video game. Uh, and even the more advanced one doesn't quite do them justice. But these two over here, these are generated from a dictionary learning algorithm. And intuitively, it makes sense. If I have a nice dictionary, all I need to record are the coefficients of the linear combination that generates it. And since it's a, assuming it's a good dictionary, there's a sparse number of coefficients. Another common one is in-painting. And this is where the original image has been corrupted, and chunks of the data are actually missing. In this example, they overlaid text. We don't have access to the original pixels that are under the text. And with the same idea of uh, assuming you have a nice dictionary and working with the patches, in some cases it's possible to reconstruct the image. And the final example, uh, we've probably all seen in the recent spy or cop movies. It's where they take a grainy security cam footage, and then they'll zoom in on a single pixel, and then magically you can see Jason Bourne's face perfectly. And most of that is Hollywood BS, but with the right algorithms and enough data, there are dictionary learning algorithms that can actually upscale. So given a low resolution image, you can work over these patches and improve the resolution. Yes. And that's sort of the end of the glamorous part of the field. Let's talk about some of the theory. So we'll be focusing on exact recovery. So let's go back to the matrix problem. A times x, I'm given y. I want to find a and x exactly. In many applications, there's noise, and you find a and x approximately. The two main problems in exact recovery are when, uh, is the question how many observations are necessary before a unique solution actually exists? So how many? rows of, or no, columns of x do I need before a or x actually exist uniquely? And then for all the computer scientists in the room, the, the natural next question is, 
is there an efficient algorithm to find this reconstruction? So we'll follow in Spielman, Wang, and Bright's footsteps and work with a random model for the observation matrix. That means every entry of x is a Bernoulli sub-Gaussian random variable. And all this means is that it's the product of a sub-Gaussian random variable and then an indicator random variable. And the indicator random var variable basically zeroes out chunks, uh, entries of this matrix. And we'll let theta denote the expectation. So theta represents the sparsity of our matrix. And then let's just do the standard thing, assume we have mean zero and variance one, and this is the definition we'll use for sub-Gaussian. And all your heavy hitting random variables are show up, so you've got your Gaussians and your Rademachers and most of your everyday random variables fit this model. Uh, let's spend a few moments discussing what uniqueness means in this problem. So given a, a y, a and, uh, and I reconstruct it to become A and X. Notice that if I multiply on the right of A by a diagonal matrix with all non-zero diagonals, and I multiply by the inverse on the left of X, the product is unchanged. And they'll just cancel out in the middle. And also if I permute the columns of A and apply that same permutation to the rows of X, the product is also invariant. So the best you can really hope to do is recover A and X modulo this sort of scaling and permutation. And for the rest of the talk, when I mention unique, I mean up to these two operations. All right, so let's talk about some of the previous results. Spielman, Wang, and Wright uh, published some of the first provable results in dictionary learning. One of the first results was that for the sparsity parameter between 1 over n and 1 over squared of n, that you need at least n log n observations for there to exist a unique solution with high probability. So n log n are sufficient. It's also easy to see that n log n are actually necessary. And the way to see that is if I want to reconstruct A, I have to make sure that when I look at the columns of x, every corresponding column of A shows up at least once in these linear combinations. And you can use a coupon collector argument to show that n log n selections are necessary before every column of A shows up. Okay. And their attempt at the second problem, they constructed an algorithm, we'll call it error spud for now, and they were able to prove that for p larger than n squared log squared n, then their algorithm outputs the unique solution with high probability. And you'll notice that n squared log squared n differs from the previous bound by a whole linear term, n. And they conjectured that, in fact, their algorithm, or their existing algorithm, that achieves the n log n bound from before. Within that sparsity parameter. So one of our main results with uh, Van Vu is to show that, in fact, n log cubed n samples are necessary for their algorithm to add, output a solution with high probability. And it always hurts to have to put an asterisk next to your main result, but it was shown by Jelani and a student of his, uh, Basilak, that our argument uh, overlooked part of the algorithm. And they redressed the issue by modifying error spite a little bit. And so for the rest of the talk, uh, it's important to remember that this theorem applies to their modified version of their, the algorithm, which I'll present in a little bit. And the main tool for proving this algorithm is actually tightening up the analysis. There's a concentration bound used by Spiel and Wang and Wright that we improve with a chaining type argument. We'll see that shortly. Okay. And then on the side, we were able to come up with a different algorithm that works in the very sparse regime. So on the order of 1 over n. 
And this actually uh, achieves the optimal bound and log n. And there was another conjecture in the Spielman, Wang, and Wright paper about generalizing their algorithm to handle non-square matrices. So uh, rectangular, non-invertible. And we were able to modify the algorithm to handle a particular type of rectangular matrix. And if we have time, we'll discuss that. All right, so let's move on to the actual algorithm itself. The intuition is fairly simple. So if you remember the equation y equals a times x, you can see that the row space of x and the row space of y are the same. But since I know that x is sparse, it's a good bet that the sparsest vectors in the row space of y are actually the rows of x. So what I'd like to do, and this is a way to formalize that intuition, is to find the sparsest vectors in the row space of y, the matrix I'm given. And this is, this is non-convex and a hard problem, so I'm just going to pull off the natural trick and relax it to the L1 norm, uh, which we know promotes sparsity. So instead, there's some details of the algorithm that are worth learning someday. But for this talk, we can think of these extra constraints as just forbidding the trivial solution. So we're going to pair up all the pairs of columns, and then we sum them together, and then we apply this minimization procedure with this constraint. And so for each pair, it's possible that it outputs a different minimization. And so we're going to reconstruct x greedily. So for every pair, it spits out a row. And we add this row to x if and only if it doesn't lie in, the, uh, lie in the span of the previous rows. So we're going to inductively build x until the dimensions match. For the analysis, it's convenient to make the following substitution in notation. And it's a little early for you to follow all of this, so let's just jump to this line. The, the previous minimization problem is equivalent to minimizing this, z transpose x subject to b transpose z, where b is a sum of the columns of x. Now notice that this solution is going to be a row of x precisely when z is one sparse, or a scaled row of x, right? and we don't care about scaling. So really, the proof of the algorithm boils down to showing that once I minimize this, it spits out something where z star is one sparse. And in their proof, they show the sparsity of z star in stages. And we're going to focus on the stage that requires this chaining. OK. So there's a fair amount of indexing here. I'm not sure how worth it it is to, to follow it precisely. But let, we're, going to do, uh, we're going to prove it by contradiction. Well, we're going to show that the output z star, its support, is contained in b. And remember, b is a sum of two columns of x, so it's sparse also. So we suppose it's not, and then we denote z0, the projection of z star, onto the support that we're interested in. And z1 is just the leftover. Now, with a little algebra and the couple applications of the triangle inequality, you get the, this guy in the middle here. And the important thing to notice is that if the two terms on the right are positive, then z0 transpose x, in fact, has a lower objective value than z star. That's the contradiction we're looking for. Z star is supposed to be the minimal value when it's outputted. So, and also notice that this term, when you take the expectation, you get p minus 2 times the size of s, and then times a positive expectation. And with Chernoff's bound, the Chernoff's bound, you can show that this guy is bounded away from 0, and this is a positive expectation. So really, the whole problem boils down to showing that x transpose v is concentrated around its positive expectation. So if you didn't care about the dictionary learning 
apart. Uh, this is a nice opportunity to start caring again. Because we're just going to, we've abstracted away most of the application, and we're going to focus on the concentration result for the rest of the talk. And the subtle thing is that we want this concentration to hold for all V and Rn simultaneously. Yeah, so x is a, um, n by p, so it looks like this. And each entry is a product of a, oh, I forget my notation. Uh, well, I think this is the indicator random variable. And then I used, and this is a sub-Gaussian. And they're independent, and all the entries are independent. So let's say 0, 1, indicator. Yeah, exactly. Sparsity is controlled entirely by this guy. Yep. Yeah, if it helps, it's, you can think of this as a plus or minus one random variable. So it's never zero. So the sparsity is entirely due to this. Yep. And so the intuition is P needs to be sufficiently large for this concentration to occur. Now, x transpose v, you can see the one norm is just the sum of i d random variables. And so there are some technical things we have to get out of the way. We're going to find mu min to be the minimal expectation of the one norm for a fixed vector v. Notice that it suffices to deal with the unit sphere, the L1 sphere, since scaling won't affect the equation. So let mu min be the minimal expectation on the unit sphere for a fixed vector v. And now we define the event, bad event v to be when x transpose v deviates from its expectation by more than this minimal expectation. So what does this guarantee? If the bad event does not occur, then you know for sure that x transpose v is positive. And now the whole goal is to show that this happens for all v with high probability. And technically, there's a union bound you have to beat with this probability. But you can check the original sources to see that, or Jelani's paper. OK, and for the sake of exposition, let's make the assumption that these guys are just the Rademacher random variables, plus minus 1. It'll make things cleaner. I've seen a lot of these definitions. So an epsilon net, again, is just a bunch of points on the unit sphere, such that every point in the sphere is within epsilon of one of those net points. And let's recall these expectation bounds again. So mu min is p squared of theta over n. And mu max is p theta. And with a little time, you can figure out that the minimum, minimal expectation is achieved when all the mass is equally distributed. So since we're on the L1 sphere, it's 1 over n, 1 over n, 1 over n. And when all the mass is concentrated on one coordinate, let's say 1, 0, 0, 0, then the maximal expectation happens. All right, so let's talk about the standard argument, which is just having the, each point in the net duke it out with Bernstein's inequality, the concentration at that point. This is the most common one you'll see in computer science. And so let's construct the net. There's some details missing, but it turns out uh, for epsilon, n equal to n to the negative 2 suffices for our arguments. So one way to construct the net is just explicitly. We're going to make, look at all the multiples at every coordinate of n to the negative 3 and make sure that this sums to 1 then any point in L1 can be at most n times n to the negative 3 away from one of those points, which makes it at n to the negative 2 net. And it's easy to calculate the size of this net. It's e to the 4 n log n. I'm going to write this because we're going to compare it to an exponential bound, probability bound, in a little bit. So now that we've discretized it, we can use the union bound. We just need a probability concentration result. And this is well suited. Uh, the Bernstein bound works well in this case. 
So if you don't remember, it's the probability, uh, ignore that max. It's the probability that s minus expectation of s greater than t depends on the variance and the L infinity norm of this random variable. OK. And there's a nauseating amount of algebra up here. But if you put the time in now to understand it, the next few slides will go easier. So let zi be just one of those random variables in the L1 sum. So the goal is to apply Bernstein's inequality, I need to know the variance and the almost sure bound on the, probability, uh, on the random variable. And so for the variance, it's easy to see that's this p times the variance of one of them. And then if you track this calculation through, you'll get p times theta. And zi, since I assumed it's a plus or minus one random variable, it's almost surely bounded by one. So I can use tau equals one in the Bernstein bound. Right. Jam this all into the previous equation and you're going to get 2e to the negative c squared p over n. And what does this guy have to beat? The previous net was e to the n log n. To have the whole thing go to 0, I need p greater than some large constant times n squared log n. And this is uh, one of the reasons you see n squared log squared n in the original Spielman algorithm. Okay. At the time of when we were working on this problem, we did not know about chaining. Yeah. Sorry, can you prove the bracket will be so for which part did you just prove this? Uh, I proved a weaker version of the statement. So I proved that for p greater than n squared log n. Oh, but what was this part? Uh, one over n between one over n and one over squared of n. Okay, right, so we, uh, right, oops, where am I? All right, so we weren't aware of uh, chaining or much less generic chaining at the time of the argument. And so our formulation is a bit simplistic when we, uh, and our way to beat the union bound. Uh, but I think it's a more intuitive way to think about it and I'm, I'm used, to, used to this formulation. So let's imagine that in fact, I can cluster up all the points of n0 such that the bad matrices in each cluster have a huge overlap. And that makes intuitive sense, right? If for a fixed vector v, the bad matrices are the ones such that x times v is large. But if v, is, uh, v and u are close, then the bad matrices that should have a large overlap. And so instead of summing over each bad probability in the net, now it reduces to summing over each bad probability in the cluster and then making up for all the missed probability in each cluster. So let's say we have m clusters. For each of those, I'm going to sum over m times the Bernstein bound. And then for the second term, I'm summing over every point in the net, but now I'm doing only the difference in the probabilities. And so here's a nice kindergarten way of drawing it. So each of these ovals are the bad matrices associated with one point in the vector, uh, one point in the net. Okay. And imagine that I take out a big chunk when I choose a representative from each cluster. So I sum over all of these, that knocks out those. But now instead of summing over every oval again, that's quite wasteful. I'm summing over just these missed portions. And if I can get a bound on these, then if m is much less than the number of points, and p1 is much better than p0, then that already leads to a significant improvement. And then as we know, uh, you can iterate this argument and chain it. And since we didn't know about generic chaining, we constructed a lot of these nets by hand, explicitly. And I will present the original solution, mainly because it gives you a peek under the hood of what's going on instead of using these high-powered uh, industrial bounds that we'll see later. And one of the key points is that we construct our net using an L infinity norm rather than the L1 norm, the natural one. So 
This is just to help you recall what we're trying to prove. And at this point in the workshop, we all know that chaining is a pretty economical way to deal with probability space. Uh, but this parsimony isn't inherited by the notation or the technicalities. So instead of presenting the general argument, I'm going to just show a toy argument that uses just two levels of this chaining. And it won't get the optimal answer, but it'll show you the intuition. So again, I'm going to start with the same net as before, all multiples of n to negative 3. Now I'm going to introduce a new set of points, n1 prime. And these are all the multiples of n to the negative 1 half. And this is not my next lay, uh, my net. I'm going to use these to cluster the n0 points, so that everything within a cluster has L infinity norm 1 over square root of n or maybe 2 times 1 over square root of n. And once I've done that, I can partition each cluster into a, a small number of, I can add some extra partitions to guarantee that the expectations are close. And I don't lose too much because we're, the expectations live in this one-dimensional space. So at the end of the day, I know each cluster has L infinity norm well-behaved, and also the expectations are close. And from each of these clusters, I choose one point, and that's my next layer of the net. And again, since I don't lose too much in extra partitioning to handle the expectation, let's just say, let's just say uh, n1 and n1 prime are about equal. And we chose these chunks to partition the L1 sphere because they're easy to count. So if I know I move in chunks of 1 over square root of n, then I can have at most square root of n non-zero entries. So that's the n choose square root of n. And for each of those entries, there are square root of n choices for the value. And then you get a, a net of size squared e to the square root of n log n. So with the naive union bound, the net was n log n. So already here, we're saving a square root of n in the exponent. And now we pray that you can also save in the difference of the probability, the bad events. So now look at u in the, the higher layer of the net. If I know that one's well behaved, but there's a point in the larger net that's not, then this event must occur. So I can now bound the event that this bad event occurs by this one, the difference of the two values. So you can think of that as uh, x transpose v minus x transpose u must be large if the two values are significantly different, which is the triangle in quantity. Good, so now we can focus on this new random variable, x transpose v minus x transpose u. And what's nice about our construction is that we have a lot of control on v minus u, right, by, uh, by a little planning. So let's, when we calculate the variance, we use our L infinity bound, and we get that the variance is 2 theta square root of n, 1 over square root of n, and then it's actually a little trickier to handle the other part, the almost sure bound, but that has nothing to do with chaining, so we'll talk about it some other day. Anyways, you get this final bound over here. Now let's compare this to the previous one. In the first level, now that I'm doing the size of the smaller net times p0, I save a square root of n, because the size of that net was square root of n less. And now in this one, I save a square root of n in the variance count, over here. But the size of the net was now the same as the original. So in each summon, you save a square root of n. And so for this to go to little of 1, p just has to be n to the 3 halves. And this is just with two layers of a net. And then if you iterate this, we weren't able to prove n log n, but you're able to get n times some polylog. And to deal with the second one, uh, we and to deal with the second term, we introduce the new technique where you truncate for Bernstein's bound. And actually, Jelani and a student had another another way to handle this. 
So let's talk about the undercomplete dictionaries. Those were the rectangular ones conjectured by Spielman, Wang, and Wright. And in practice, the more important ones are the overcomplete. That's when, uh, let's see. Yes, that's dictionaries of this size. We weren't able to solve that one. But for the undercomplete, the idea is pretty simple. So undercomplete looks something like this. What I would like to do is use the air split algorithms. I don't have to think of anything new. And so it'd be nice if I could just complete this to an invertible square matrix. And same with x. So x now looks like this. But to account for this added chunk, I have to add my own. But the problem is you're not given a and x in the beginning, right? I'm only given this product. But assume for now that I am able to complete it with an A tilde and an X tilde. Then their product is actually the given matrix Y plus some matrix that I generated. AX plus A tilde, X tilde. And the problem of not knowing A is handled easily. We just generate A tilde randomly. And with high probability, you can show that that is an invertible matrix. So once that's done, I have an AX plus A tilde X tilde. When I apply the air spud algorithm, or a variance of it, it spits out the columns of A and the columns of X, and X tilde and an A tilde. But I know exactly what the columns of A tilde and X tilde are, and I can remove those. In theory, that should give you an efficient way to find A and X. And of course, there's the technical problem of when you're dealing with discrete random variables, that with high probability, you can actually make this invertible. And as long as A was full rank to begin with, there's a powerful result by uh, Borgain, Vu, and Wood that shows that filling in those remaining columns randomly actually makes it invertible with high probability. Okay, so we have some time to talk about some uh, very recent work just a few months ago by uh, Adam Zak, Basiak, and Jelani. And they were able to use some more powerful chaining arguments to remove the extra polylog term. Uh, my guess is that by that time, it was too late to rescind my invitation to speak. So I will do my best to summarize their work especially since I, I think all the authors are in the audience right now. So, embarrassing. OK, so let's run over some of the main ideas. We won't get into too many of the details. And we've seen a lot of these bounds in other talks. So we'll follow the work of Blasiak and Nelson. And they prove a more quantitative, quantitative version so with that extra delta thrown in. But essentially, all it means is that uh, it's the same problem, but now they've cut it down to n log n. And we're familiar with these definitions from the first talk by Jelani. Admissible sequences and these gamma functionals. So here are some facts. Uh, this first theorem gives you an efficient way to calculate gamma 2 functional in the L2 norm. And it just claims that the expectation of the supremum over Gaussian random variables behaves roughly the same. And the second one gives you a nice way to calculate gamma 1 in the L infinity norm. But now you're dealing with the supremum over exponential random variables. And then this, there's a nice uh, generic chaining result. It'd be wrong if Talagrand didn't make an appearance. So he has this. If we know that there's some nice concentration in the difference, then using generic chaining, you can bound the expectation of the supremum with the gamma 2 and the gamma 1 functionals. And really, this theorem was only used in their paper to deal with the symmetrization and shifting of the mean. So we won't see it too much. The most useful one is this result by Schoen. And uh, as he mentioned yesterday, he developed a, an argument to use generic chaining to find tail bounds. And that's essentially what we're interested in. And again, you'll recognize this from our argument, that we need to control 
the difference of xu and xv. So putting it in the original language, everything boils down to finding these gamma 2s and gamma 1s. And it's a little hard to digest and understand where uh, the L2 norm and the L infinity norm show up. And that's why I showed the, our first argument. It's a little more transparent. But using the facts from before, a gamma 2 is easily calculated since you use the duality of the L1 and L infinity norm, and it boils down to just the max of a bunch of Gaussians, and you get squared to log n. And gamma 1, you can use the same argument using properties of the exponential random variables. Okay. And then there is this intermediate step where you have to show the difference has this concentration. And for that, that was a key step in our argument before. And you can also use properties of sub-gamma variables that I was not aware of. So combining these slides, we find the following concentration result. It's a little messy, but a quick calculation shows that to make the right side arbitrarily small, p being larger than epsilon squared and log n over delta suffices. And that is the optimal bound. And I'd like to thank uh, Dan Spielman for introducing us to this, the field of dictionary learning and also bringing this particular problem to our attention. All right, thank you. Ah, oh, okay. Oh, no training. Oh, okay. That's but also a Telegram result, right? Ah, okay. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yes. And. Uh, well, that was, that was sort of like the undercomplete dictionary. So you, basically, you have a high dimensional, your data lives in a high dimensional space, but you can represent it with a dictionary that's low. OK, yeah. Oh, let's see. I see. Uh, I mean, you can probably use this dimensionality embedding stuff and then apply the algorithm in that lower dimension, yes? Okay. Thank you.